Well, it's my great pleasure to be here. I'm Richard Ayler with uh, the Division of Infectious Diseases, Department of Internal Medicine at the University of South Florida um, Morsani College of Medicine. A couple of years ago, I was invited to co-author an article on infectious diseases resources for smartphones. Well, the article was well received and the experience made me realize that there's often a knowledge gap when it comes to understanding what resources are out there for clinicians to, like us to use in medicine. So I thought I would put together a presentation highlighting some of the more useful electronic resources that are out there for internal medicine clinicians. Some disclosures. And some caveats. Please keep in mind that I can't discuss every resource out there. And there's probably something really cool out there that the listener knows about that I may have overlooked. There's just so many resources. It's hard to choose to, to, to talk about any particular one. There are many e-textbooks and subscription sites or apps available, but it's really the ones you can get for free that are the gems, and I've tried to concentrate on those. I'm primarily a user of the Apple ecosystem, but many out there also use Android, and most smartphone resources are available for at least both of these platforms. And I will include a handout uh, available on idpodcast.net uh, that will be provided for every resource that I plan to discuss. So there was a time where digital medicine had a completely different connotation. And similarly, when we talk with our patients about their tablets, can we really be sure they know what we're talking about? So the digital age of medicine is really a new frontier. And it's not just for us as healthcare providers. WebMD has some 20 million unique visitors monthly, and the top five medical websites garner almost 80 million unique visitors per month. And eight out of 10 internet users have looked online for health information, according to a Pew Internet Research study. Furthermore, the American public is increasingly using social media resources for health-related information. And for me personally, my interest in healthcare technology has grown alongside my fascination with ID. And I see this in my ID colleagues as well. After all, infectious diseases is a young specialty when compared with the big three of cardiovascular, pulmonary, and GI. And it's been said to know ID is to know medicine. There's a vast informational database that's required. Fast access to knowledge is essential. And lastly, teaching is also essential to what we do and technology provides us with the tools to teach. Now at the time I presented this podcast I was reminiscing about my 20th year uh, since my 20th year anniversary since I graduated from medical school and um, so recently I've had an opportunity to reflect on the electronic tools I had 20 years ago when I was a medical student. This is a picture from uh, my medical school yearbook, and it shows some of the things I used 20 years ago. Um, looks like 3D was big in 1992. Thank goodness that never came back. Stethoscopes looked about the same, and those of you who remember photographic slides remember that uh, producing a presentation 20 years ago was more akin to a summer-long project than it was to the throw them up on the screen PowerPoint talks we have today. In fact, a discussion of high technology for 1992 might include mention of laptop computers that were too big to fit on your lap, floppy disks that weren't really floppy, photo slides that jammed in the projector, burned up, got out of order, or got lost, brick phones that were better hand warmers, modems that chirped like R2-D2, and early CD-ROMs that were really better frisbees and drink coasters than data storage devices. In fact, looking to where we were 
20 years ago, it's rather amazing to consider what we didn't have. In 1992, we had no networking, no internet, no Wi-Fi, no broadband, no cellular data networks, no smartphones, no flash drives, no PowerPoint, no tablets, no DVD, much less Blu-ray, no USB, no MP3 players, no PDFs, no flat screen displays, no LCD projectors, and much and more than than anything else we had no search engines that's no Google no Bing no Yahoo no ask Jeeves nothing it's amazing we got any work done so how do we get from the Stone Age of 1992 to where we are now it was really on the basis of three breakthroughs the first occurred with the introduction of the World Wide Web in 1995 it had re really first been proposed in 1990, but was really not accessible until that year. The first websites were sparse, software was glitchy, and medical searches were limited, although PubMed first came online in 1996. The Internet's effect on medicine was initially more subtle than revolutionary. Suddenly it was possible to share knowledge with others about clinical care without a face-to-face -face chat or prolonged phone conversation. Because communication is so important to what we do, many physicians were early adopters of email and online blogs. And a radical idea began to develop that perhaps the body of medical knowledge was far wider than even the few hundred pages of a hardbound textbook of medicine in your bookcase. That the body of new scientific literature was far broader than the handful of journals you got in the mail each week. And that's really when the printed textbook began to become obsolete. And as the World Wide Web was starting up, personal digital assistants or PDAs were gaining popularity. Those of you who remember these devices will recall that Palm and Windows mobile devices were the major formats and they featured installable apps and some even had handwriting recognition and internet connectivity. Around 2001 the first smartphone called Simon was released on the upper right corner of the screen. Now I think most of us will mark 2007 as the third breakthrough, the, the modern age of smartphones, the year that everything changed. With the introduction that year of the original iPhone, followed by the introduction of the first Android smartphone, the HTC Dream in 2009, and the first practical tablet device, the iPad in 2010. And with the continued development of the iPad and other tablets, desktop and portable computers began to fall out of favor with many users. So here we are in 2012. We were warned, by the way. Everyone predicts uh, our ongoing doom, but we're still here tapping on our smartphones and tablets. So what's the few, the few essential online electronic sites for 2012 that I think everyone in internal medicine should know about. I'm going to first address um, online electronic tools and then move on to discuss what's available in portable resources for smartphones and tablets, especially apps. And I'll conclude by discussing what's available in online social media including blogs, social networks, multimedia podcasts, and YouTube. So I came across this page in Amazon, on the Amazon website, and I have to ask, is this really a textbook about dinosaurs, or does it imply that it is the textbook that's a dinosaur? This is a major change that's occurred in the last 20 years, as fewer and fewer medical students residents and clinicians look to the printed textbook as a source of medical information. So medical textbooks versus online resources, which is better? When you buy a textbook it's accurate only as to the publishing date. With each succeeding day it's out of date. Whereas online resources, or online references are continuously updated. They never go out of date. The purchase of a textbook involves a single printed copy 
It's only available in one location, and if you happen to practice in another location other than where your bookcase is, you're out of luck. Online references, in contrast, are available in, on multiple devices in many different locations. Number of locations can be relatively unlimited. Textbooks require typesetting, printing, inventory, storage, shipping, boxing, and, and more storage when after they're purchased. And therefore, they have very high production costs. Online references exist in the virtual world. They, they don't have space that's physical space that's necessary for them to be stored and magnetic and electronic space is relatively minor. So they have low production costs in comparison. And lastly, textbooks have uh, oftentimes are, are black and white. They have limited color either in images or in print. Black and white photos are often the norm. That's because um, the more multimedia that's incorporated in a book, the more expensive it is. Whereas online reference sources have the potential for rich multimedia. Uh, there's really no limit, even video. So if I were going to recommend a handful of online resources that every internist should know, the first would be ACP Online, the American College of Physicians web portal. I mean, where else can you find comprehensive clinical information, including practice guidelines and peer tools, specific information on running your practice, and information on board certification and recertification, all tailored to your career level and specifically designed for internal medicine physicians? There's also an extensive amount of patient-oriented information, calendars for ACP meetings and events, and a section on mobile resources, including a free app called the ACP Immuno immunization advisor which you can download to your smartphone and can help you review the indications and contraindications of most adult vaccines. There's also a free version of the annals for your iPad. Now the New England Journal website enhances and in many ways supersedes the paper-bound version of this essential publication. In addition to including the latest journal articles from the current week, the site also includes an extensive collection of multimedia resources such as images and videos in clinical medicine, interactive medical cases, and audio summaries. They've also done something quite admirable in recent years. They've unlocked their New England Journal archives all the way back to 1990, meaning that you don't need a subscription to access older journal articles for the last 22 years. So there's a lot of content here that is accessible without a subscription. And as I always like to say, free is good. Now, in my opinion, up-to-date was really one of the major factors in the shift of medical resources online. It was co-founded in 1992 by Bud Rose from Harvard and Joe Rush from the University of Florida. It was originally a CD-ROM reference, but first went online in 2000. Today, it's used by over 360 thousand clinicians worldwide in more than 145 countries and covers 14 specialties. Now think of this mind-boggling fact. If up-to-date were a textbook, it would be over 80,000 pages long. 80,000 pages long. So it's no wonder that textbooks cannot compete with online reference sources. No one could own an 80,000 page hardbound textbook. Now most of you have used it and although it's a subscription resource it's available in many ho hospitals for free. So take advantage of the opportunity to use this when you're in the hospital and it'll be a free resource and as I said before free is good. Now I'm not going to say very much about PubMed except that everyone should be using it for literature review. There also seems to be a lot more free text articles linked to PubMed these days. There are also several mobile apps that interface with it. 
Now medical library resources such as what we have here at the University of South Florida Health Sciences Center are outstanding and they complement PubMed for the latest literature. A detailed discussion of all of these resources would really be facility dependent and it's beyond the confines of this talk. But, at the, but as the slide suggests, ask your medical librarian for more information. Now here's another resource that's quite valuable that, and one that's near, to, near and dear to our heart. ID Podcast is USF's own comprehensive medical resource for infectious diseases founded by the ID Division in 2007. We just celebrated our fifth anniversary. We feature podcasts from all of our educational conferences and events that are playable on your computer, smartphone, tablet, and internet-capable TV, such as Apple TV, through a variety of formats. This year, we've started a YouTube channel where all of our podcasts are based. We also have dedicated smartphone and tablet apps that are available through Android or the App Store for free. Um, again, free is good, and this is a great University of South Florida resource that many people across the Internet have taken advantage of. So we're going to move on here to talk about resources for mobile devices. Now, I was born in the 1960s, and when I think about the first time I saw a handheld digital device, it had to be on one of my all-time favorite 1960s sci-fi TV series, the original Star Trek. I found it fascinating that you could have a device small enough to fit in your hands and that could tell you everything you needed to know about the world around you, namely the tricorder. And this world could be as exotic as Cestus III or Rigel 12, or as native as the planet Earth. Similarly, the medical version of this device could pretty much diagnose any medical condition faster than you could say Vulcan mind meld. And I think many of us have been hoping for something like this ever since. By the 1980s version of Star Trek, the personal digital assistant had morphed into an android, Commander Data, perhaps the first android operating system, no pun intended. The science fiction premise was that if you could morph human characteristics into a digital device, it would make it even more useful. By the time I graduated from medical school in 1992, I was much less sophisticated. This was my personal digital assistant for 1992. Those were my digits and this was my assistant and index card. Primitive, but it got the job done, although I later became more sophisticated with my PDAs. In 1997 I later ended up using one of these which was um, which was useful, very primitive, but the battery life was outstanding. I don't think it's any device um, since the Palm Pilot has uh, has been equal in its battery life as this device did. But trust me, we're in a much better place now in 2012 than we were back then. These are currently the two most popular um, smartphones, the Samsung Galaxy S3 and the iPhone 5. So apps for medicine. It, it's important to remember that apps were originally not a smartphone feature. The first medical functionality was through web applications and it was not until 2008 that uh, the next generation iPhone, the iPhone 3G, supported apps and the App Store came into existence. As a result, medical publishers were initially very guarded, but then they became more enthusiastic about creating apps for mobile devices. Many initial apps were free, but as time has gone on, more subscription resources have been available, have become available. And most apps support the two main platforms, Android and iOS. A lot of the functionality of apps may vary by whether or not you have Wi-Fi access in your institution, and this can vary. Tablets can have greater functionality of many medical apps, although smartphones appear to be the most popular. 
And it's not just your smartphone that's becoming an indispensable tool. Now many clinicians are taking their tablets along on rounds, and medical apparel makers are all too happy to play along. Of course, if the Apple iPad is too big for your pocket, why not just make it smaller? This is expected to be announced within the next few weeks. So let's talk about apps. 25 billion is a big number, and it's growing steadily every day. There are more than 700,000 apps in the Apple App Store as of this presentation, of which about a third are specifically for iPad. Over 600,000 apps reside on Google Play, formerly the Android Marketplace. So the real challenge is not finding a medical app, it's finding the gems, especially the free gems that will enhance your practice. For the purposes of giving this talk, I divided medical apps into, the, into these broad categories. Medical simulators mimic some sort of medical procedure and allow you to use the functionality of your, your smartphone or tablet to help you learn the procedure and maybe some anatomic landmarks or other information. Web portal apps are mobile versions of the online medical web portals for medical information, patient care, CME, and, the inter and with interaction with your colleagues. News or journal or article applications present medical news or mobile versions of the med sites of popular medical journals, such as, let's say, the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic medical publications. Reference or therapy guides include popular drug reference guides or present treatment recommendations. And symptom diagnosis applications help make a medical diagnosis based upon patient symptoms and other data. So there are estimated to be more than 15,000 medical apps out there, more than you could ever fit in your smartphone or tablet. But fortunately, there are online sites that can help you skim the cream off the top. Of one of these, I like iMedical Apps, a website that's online. It's frequently updated, easy to navigate, and it has good objective standards for reviewing medical applications. But in addition to this site, there are several other websites that give reviews and some even have a peer review process, a strict peer review process for apps, which I think is a great development. So among the three meta the 3D medical simulation apps, I think iLarynx is one of the ones I would definitely recommend. It allows you to practice intubating a patient with fiber optic laryngoscopy. Utilizing the iPad's accelerometer and on-screen buttons, you can manipulate the scope, insert it into the larynx, learn anatomy as you approach the vocal cords, and of course there's no patient risk. And I think it really has some novel ideas for your future virtual apps. So here I am about to intubate the patient with laryngoscopy. I'm going uh, past the uvula into the larynx. I see the vocal cords and, uh, and the, the, the trachea. First time I did this I kept bumping up against the uh, vocal cords and, and being coughed out, but and eventually I was able to correctly intubate the patient, and you get an intubation success screen as a reward. So I think many different applications may stem from this. Imagine an application that could help you learn endoscopy or colonoscopy or cardiac surgery or um, some other medical procedure. And this one is free, readily downloadable to your device. MedPage Today I like because it really is a medical USA Today for your tablet or smartphone. When you register for this it, and, and give it some basic personal information, it, it uh, generates an up-to-date medical page that's suited to your specialty. Um, for instance, here is an article from my page on the presidential election. You can email or tweet articles to colleagues, has a very smooth interface, and there's um, a tab for CME, so you can have CME credit opportunities. It's really a nicely done free application for your iPad, tablet, or smartphone. 
I would consider Medscape to be among the best integrated app applications for smartphones and tablets. Where it excels is it has a superior drug reference section which unlike Hippocrates includes over-the-counter medications and herbals. It also includes a, um, a, a drug interaction checker, news, and CME content as well. Here is a reference for devil's claw type of herbal. This is the drug interaction checker. This is the internal medicine medical news section with pertinent articles tailored to me. And there's also, as I said, a CME that's available. And what's also nice about this application is you can download all of the application to your device so that no Wi-Fi or internet access is available. This helps if you're in a situation where you're residing or working um, in a in a building where there's no Wi-Fi and you still need access to the content of this app. Well, you can download it all if you desire and have it available um, in short notice. And this is a free resource, so free is good. Micromatics is nice because it doesn't really require any pre-registrations or notifications. It's good to go once you open it and download download it and open the, the application. There's an iPad specific version also available and it really excels in mechanism of action info and patient teaching. So again look at Micromedics on your device as a great resource for drug related information that's totally free. Here's the uh, entry screen with a listing of, of uh, drug products. Here's a entry site for clopidogrel showing uh, contraindications, uh, drug interaction medications, and here's a listing for clopidogrel. Well if there was a uh, Medical Journal Hall of Fame, I think New England Journal would be one of the first inaugural members. When this app was first developed in 2010 it was supposed to be free for a short time well thankfully it's still free and this application allows you access to the last seven days of published articles on the New England Journal of Medicine website it has an images of clinical medicine uh, section it also includes weekly auto audio summaries and full reads of clinical practice articles and and what's more, it includes how-to videos for procedures. So if you're about to do a chest tube insertion or a paracentesis, um, you can watch these videos and get up-to-date up um, pointers on techniques and proper procedures. Hippocrates should really be in the Hall of Fame of medical apps if such a Hall of Fame existed. It's been on mobile devices since 1998 when it ran on the Palm Pilot. It's now available on multiple platforms including Blackberry and the free version Hippocrates RX includes drug monographs, health plan formularies, a pill identifier, medical news and other things. Now if you want uh, ID treatment guide, disease monographs, ICD-9 codes, you can get the paid version of Hippocrates but I think really the, the best parts of uh, this application are available for free. And um, I think it is a, uh, one of the best of the medical apps that's out there. Again, this is uh, the drug list, again, categorized by drug classes. Here's an entry for fluconazole or diflucan. The drug interaction checker I use all the time. It's, it's tremendous and it's very explanatory, has a good uh, educational section when it's talking about uh, the interactions between two different agents. The Sanford Guide to Antimicrobial Therapy, this is the smartphone version of the paper-bound guide that's been published annually for uh, more than uh, 40 years. It features expert-driven recommendations for treating various infectious diseases authored by some of the most prominent infectious disease specialists in the nation. Um, includes information, extensive information on syndromes, on drugs, 
It has several useful clinical calculators, talks about prophylaxis, duration of therapy. It's really like having an ID clinician in your pocket or in your smartphone. The Universal app supports uh, both the iPhone and the iPad, and it's available for a very nominal annual subscription. I think it's less than $20. Some practitioners or clinicians prefer the Johns Hopkins Antibiotic Guide. Again, this uh, is a concise, authoritative uh, summary of antimicrobials and the diseases they produce. Um, this, it's available for Android and Apple devices. It is compatible for tablets. It requires an annual subscription, but it's comparable in price to, it po to um, the Sanford Guide. So a second very useful application for your smartphone. I like the Infectious Diseases Compendium. This is the mobile app version of the popular Pusware site by Dr. Mark Chrislip. He uh, this is a, a summary of ID knowledge organized by bugs, drugs, and diseases. What's nice is that uh, Dr. Chrislip is a very humorous fellow and he intersperses entries with humorous comments that will make you laugh as you're learning ID. There are Android and iOS versions and the Universal app does support the iPad. So here's an entry for CatBite, for example, and it says, Diagnosis, I was bitten by a cat. Epidemiologic risks, Kitty, 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 nice kitty. Damn it, it bit me in the hand. So this is a, a very humorous and a very well-informed way to learn ID. It's also updated frequently. Among me medical calculators, there are four popular choices. Um, the free version of Skyscape, the free downloadable app, includes a free medical calculator called Archimedes, which has 150 calculators, although the interface is sometimes a little bit clunky. Both Calculate and MedMap, or, or MedMath rather, are also free. Calculate has 150 calculators, has a little bit more intuitive data input. MedMath comes with the free version of Hippocrates, but only has 45 calculators and no search function. My personal favorite is MedCalc, which recently um, was increased in price to 99 cents has 150 calculators, it's searchable, you can list your favorites, and it has an out-of-range data guard. So here's Archimedes, here's uh, Calculate by QXMD, here's MedMath by Hippocrates, again only the 45 calculators, and lastly here's MedCalc. Medical Eponyms, also an extremely useful app that's available for free. This has also been around for many years. It's a collection of over 1,700 eponyms in uh, searchable fashion in, over, in, in about 25 categories. Whether you're a medical student beginning your first year or an attending, the eponyms are suitable for all levels. It also wins the award for the most platforms that support it from iOS and Android to, to Palm OS to Blackberry to Windows and it's completely free. Here you can see that it has a very well um, drawn out and, uh, and, and very elaborate um, series of uh, eponym explanations. This is Ar Argyle Robertson pupils. You can see what extensive um, description it has. So it's a great way to learn and also to, um, to quiz uh, attendings or fellows or residents that you work with on a uh, medical concept. Doximity. Um, if, uh, if you look at uh, the screen here for Doximity, it sort of reminds you of another application. kind of reminds you of Hippocrates, and it's no wonder because it's by the co-founder of Hippocrates. This is a private Facebook for doctors. There's currently over 80,000 physicians for mem physician members. What you do is you sign up for this and you're instantly linked with medical school classmates and colleagues you can add from your training or local area. A big plus is um, the HIPAA compliant messaging. Uh, this allows you to send messages to colleagues that you have identified within the application. Um, that way you can not run afoul of uh, HIPAA regulations for transferring medical information. 
You can also index local resources, pharmacies, imaging centers, and hospitals. It's, I find it a great way to connect with colleagues that I never thought I'd locate. For instance, when I had a uh, recent uh, medical school reunion, I was able to sign up with Doximity and, and actually locate every single person in my med graduating medical school class on a U.S. map by where their practice location was. This was uh, this is truly a neat way to connect with people and also communicate with people about from on a social basis or um, related to uh, you know to your profession. Dr. Mole is one of the first augmented reality apps for medicine. What it does is it you take a picture of a mole and it uses real-time computer technology to scan the mole and give you feedback on the ABCDs. If you you can you can also take a picture of a mole and then follow it over time by repeating the picture, you know, weeks to months later. Here's the uh, analysis results screen showing uh, risk factors by asymmetry, border color, border regularity, or color, etc. Um, this is a paid app, but it's available for a very small fee, and there's Android and iOS versions available. And let's not forget ID Podcast. This is a world-class application from your friends at the uh, USF Medical Infectious Diseases. Um, the app has been out for a couple years and features podcasts from our faculty on infectious diseases. You can search by category, author, or title. The app is universal, meaning that it also installs very natively on um, your tablet. And most of all, it's free. I'm going to touch briefly on social media and the practice of medicine. Um, as time goes on, social media resources are increasingly being integrated into medical education and clinical practice. The four major types of social media for medicine include uh, medical blogs, um, microblogs, which the most popular version is Twitter, social networks like Facebook, and multimedia resources like YouTube. Now, medical blogs um, started out initially as um, personal online journals for individuals, but they're increasingly being utilized by organizations and institutions to chronicle events, news, or for editorial commentary. So a blog is an online journal, and I apologize to the viewer, but uh, my heading of blogs got cut off here. This is the New England Journal's blog called Now that often dissects relevant articles from the journal each week in an insightful way. This is a great way to get more out of the New England Journal each week and see which of that week's articles are being the most talked about. Twitter is the most, most uh, um, well-known example of a microblog. It's hard to believe it was first established about six years ago, but since 2008 it's Popularity has really paralleled, paralleled rather the the uh, rise of smartphones, and boy are people using Twitter to the tune of a billion tweets for per week. Um, now, uh, the most popular way to issue a tweet is through a smartphone, and although you'll hear many celebrities claim that it's not whom you follow, but who follows you. In terms of medicine, I think the most important thing is is being selective about whom you follow. Now, for instance, I have a personal Twitter account and I have a professional Twitter account, and my professional Twitter account is at ID Podcast, and I follow s about 16 people, all of whom are 16 accounts, all of which index medical news or information. So, when I have a quiet moment during the day, I can log on to Twitter go to my ID podcast account and instantly get updated to the second on the latest medical information released by these um, Twitter accounts. So it's a r great way to keep track of things in medicine to the minute. It's also exciting that Twitter is searchable so you can enter a medical term and instantly get back all the public tweets that discuss that medical term. Um, for instance, here I entered MRSA and I was instantly 
taken to all the recent tweets that document MRSA. And through advanced Twitter search, you can actually um, narrow the search category to a particular location or region. So it's not only is it a great uh, search tool or historical tool, because all of the tweets are archived way back to when Twitter started, but it also permits you um, to uh, um, to be able to epidemiolo epidemiologically look through the Twitter stream for particular concepts or subjects um, which could give you a lot of information um, about the epidemiology of a particular um, topic or, or infection. It's hard to believe that Facebook is only eight years old. Um, although its initial public offering this year did not go so well, uh, many people saw the movie that dramatized its origins called The Social Network, uh, released in 2010. More than one billion users have been announced as of October of 2012. This is a big development. That's one in seven people on Earth. And of the nearly one in two Amer Americans who utilize it, as many as one quarter use it for health-related information. And many national medical organizations and academic institutions are now Facebook participants. For example, this is the ACP's uh, Facebook page featuring posts by the ACP itself as well as by individual users. And again, if you press like, you will get updates from the ACP on your Facebook page, which is a great way to keep up with ACP news and events. YouTube is another resource. It's become such an integral part of the fabric of American life. It's hard to believe that it's only seven years old. And although it was originally considered a short video clip repository in recent years, the site has been more tolerant of allowing full-length um, clips to be released, full-length videos, and we've utilized this to our advantage in, on the ID Podcast website by uh, creating our own ID Podcast channel with uh, over a hundred of our podcast videos, and this year alone we've had over 16,000 viewers. Um, and this is a great educational resource on YouTube, and I would ask the audience to look for other government entities or organizations or professional societies that have face that have YouTube channels with a lot of their content online. Again, our ID podcast channel is free. The next big thing is already here. This is from a popular commercial running right now in the war between smartphone rivals Samsung and Apple. Now the term the next big thing was first attributed to Apple co-founder Steve Jobs who was always obsessed with the concept of the next technological innovation. So what's the next big thing in medicine? Well in a world seemingly obsessed with social media some medical futurists believe it may be a concept called social medicine. Now this is not to be confused with socialized medicine. The term social medicine is based upon applying social media principles to medicine. It sees healthcare becoming more patient-centric, sort of as a personal information service that patients control in their hands. To help empower patients more to make their own healthcare decisions, personal diagnostic devices help manage their health and alert them to when it's time to seek medical care. And meanwhile, social media sites like Patients Like Me, for example, let them connect with others in a supportive way. And personal medical information is stored not in a dusty bin in a doctor's office, but in the cloud where it can easily be retrieved and updated. So this is Patients Like Me, a Facebook for patients where patients seek social media support or social support from patients who have similar medical conditions. This is available right now. Now this trend of social medicine has already gotten the attention of the New York Times as of February of this year, 2012, which reported on the trend in their personal technology section last February. 
they wrote that as savvy connected smartphone users become more possessive of managing their own health care, medical device makers are more than happy to help them do just that. And we've seen that already with several medical devices that are available that merge with a smartphone to help a patient or a physician do more of their health care in an electronic fashion. Whether that be at home, such as with the Withings blood pressure cuff or the IBG star glucose monitor or the Thermodoc thermometer, or perhaps um, in the hands of a clinician, such as with the Welsh Allen eye examiner, an ophthalmoscope that lets you image a patient's fundoscopic examination using your smartphone. Now all of these devices are available in the US now with the exception of the Thermodoc thermometer which is currently only available in Europe. Now in March of this year the technology company Qualcomm with a somewhat elderly appearing commander data there on the left announced a futuristic initiative that really made um, medical technology enthusiasts excited, namely the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize, an X Prize to develop the world's first handheld device to put healthcare totally and literally in your own hands. This Tricorder will be designed to monitor and a patient's health and wellness, provide health related information advise a patient in the prevention and management of disease and to recommend further medical evaluation when it's necessary. Now Scanadu is one of the companies competing for the X Prize under the tagline of sending your smartphone to medical school and they put together a video which I'd like to close the presentation with. Technology has given us an unprecedented window into the human body but on a day-to-day -day basis, we're still in the dark about our own health. We are changing that. You okay? Do you feel okay? What if instead of fearing the worst when you notice something out of the ordinary, you could identify the condition yourself? Getting the right diagnosis would save you worry. It says it's roseola. And an unnecessary doctor's visit. Rest at home, it's okay. Oh. Instead of hearing about a viral outbreak on the news, imagine you got an alert that was tailored to your family's needs. It would also give you advice about what to do next. What if you had a way to identify what was wrong right away? It says it's 103.8. A way to get all of the information you need to understand the situation. And in serious cases, you would know when and where to seek help. Yeah, recommends taking it to urgent care. We're building a way for people to check their bodies as often as they check their email. It's all possible, and it's only the beginning. So I hope I've been able to give you all some idea of how far we've come in technology and medicine over the last 20 years and the opportunities and challenges we face in the next two decades. Thank you all very much for listening to this podcast and please make sure you download the accompanying uh, guide to the resources I've listed in this presentation which is available on idpodcast.net. Thank you very much.